What is up, Mets fans? Welcome back to the first episode of the offseason. Literally a day later after the season ends, we got some big news. We can finally talk about it. David Stearns, officially the new president of baseball operations for the New York Mets. Buck Showalter out as the manager. You guys heard us briefly talk about it yesterday. Just a quick minute, but we'll talk a little bit more about it because we learned so much from the David Stearns press conference. James was in attendance. The hard work never stops. No days off. James Schiano, professional journalist at the press conference. Got a lot of notes for you guys. Got a lot of things to talk about. It's an exciting day for a Mets fan. I know that doesn't normally happen when the season ends, but there's a lot of buzz, a lot of excitement. We're ready to talk to you guys about it. We've been waiting for a minute. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Make sure you follow us on our social media at Mets Up on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you're looking for the YouTube video version of this, go to the New York Mets YouTube channel and subscribe over there. And if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Odyssey, drop us a rating, drop us a review, download and subscribe. We do appreciate you guys. Again, offseason's officially started, and James, what do you got for me? Dude, I don't know. This is a great day. I, I've been so excited by this news. Like, I'm, you guys know, listen to this, especially people who listened for a while, like back when they were doing the search. And a couple of years ago, Mark and I went like candidate by candidate, getting everyone's LinkedIn pages and all the information we could find on every single guy. It's just baseball is such an executive run game these days. And so much is about like your internal processes and what you're able to do as an organization from the top all the way to the bottom, from the DSL all the way to the last member of your bullpens, your closer to your shortstops, your AAA roster, everything. And just having someone like David Stearns come in who, one, take away everything about his personality, his childhood, and his fandom. Like He is so accomplished. He is so successful in what he's done across the major league organizations. We have a huge David Stearns history to go through before I give you guys some press conference notes too. But it's just that alone, the baseball of it, is so uplifting and so refreshing and something that – I, I, I've I get lifelong Mets fan. We are, we've all been through the ups and downs together. Listen to this podcast, just our lifetime of fandom. I've never felt like this for an executive, of any team I've ever rooted for in my life. Not even just the Mets where I'm just like, I trust you so much. And I can't, I can't even describe, put into words. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've been a, a little PTSD, I think with sometimes some of the decisions that get made, especially we go way, way back with the Mets and just some of the stuff that's gone on there. But to bring in a guy like David Stearns, 38 years old, Harvard grad he's been around baseball pretty you usually don't graduate Harvard and go like I want to be in baseball I want to I want to work in baseball and he worked at the I think he worked in Brooklyn right for the Cyclones at one point I think he might have even interned there I think we've heard a story or two about that so to go from Harvard to then be an intern essentially with a minor league baseball team work his way he was with the Cleveland then Indians Houston Astros Milwaukee Brewers now obviously with the New York Mets just getting a really, really smart guy who's been around winning and successful organizations pretty much his entire career. It's pretty exciting. Pretty exciting as a Mets fan. Like since Steve Cohen's gotten here or been here, he's talked about like he, he's looking for that president of baseball operations. He wants someone to man this team, take over, run it the way that it's going to be, build sustainable success, which is something that Stearns even talked about a lot in his press conference, something that's been very consistent throughout the time of Steve Cohen owning the Mets. It's just, it's it's a great day. Like you said, normally we get really, really excited for players that are coming in. This is one of those rare times you get excited for an executive coming in because I think David Stearns, I mean, I think you think it too, could be a huge, huge piece of the Mets' future here. A huge piece of the Mets' future, and just for us and all the other rabid fans, this could be a life-changing hire. Like, I, if, if, he was a, uh, if he was an executive here five years ago, I think all of our lives would be different forever. Like, he, I really just think he's that good. Like, I can't really understate how important this move could be for the organization, for the Mets community, for everything. And Steve actually told a funny story about just the fact that, like, they're – there was always like, like not there wasn't like always an inkling, but the fact that he always knew it would have made sense that he was at MLB dinner. He said, I don't remember if he said it was this year or in the past. And he said he was just hanging out at the bar, waiting for a drink, and random people were coming up to him like, "Oh, you got to hire David Stearns." <laughs> and he was like, "All right, I'll keep that one in mind." And because Stearns also did work at the MLB office, and just the big thing about Stearns again, it got hammered home a lot, is that he is a lifelong Mets fan. Like he yeah. is, he seems like, for lack of a better term, he is like us. Like, he's crazy. And then we've heard a lot about it in the statement that David Stearns released this morning through the Mets when we were getting ready for the press conference. He said, in a quote, I grew up at Shea Stadium. And the other soundbite that's going mega viral from the press conference that he said he used to sneak into Shea Stadium. So as a 13, 14-year-old kid coming from Manhattan to Queens, like trying to get in some games, he basically just like made friends with ushers, and they were sympathetic to a 14-year-old, a 13-year-old trying to watch some baseball. Also, fun fact about David Stearns, birthdays are four days apart. Me oh, fun, yeah. fun fact indeed. Another fun fact about David Stern, he's talking about the Harvard grad, political science major, just like me. 
Imagine just, that just, one. Just like you, James. A lot well, of common, yeah. commonalities there. Yeah, right? Our colleges are red-based, right? Same color scheme. Um, he also used to be a sports writer for a school paper. Like, he... I think this was always the plan with him. And his first job was an internship with the Pirates. And then he had the baseball ops job briefly with the Mets where he did do some work with the Cyclones. He shouted out some Cyclones people today in the press conference and also That's did cool. some baseball operation stuff in the Arizona Fall League. So it's just he's really done a lot of things in a lot of different places. And after those two, he spent three years working at MLB's central office. And at the time, his first job there was negotiating, working at MLB's team for negotiating the CBA in 2008. And then he was promoted to the manager of their labor relations department. Oh. And that is the department that works in the team sides of arbitration. So he saw like how the sausage got made from a young age. He's probably still at this point, like 25-ish, 26 years old, maybe even 24, where like he's on the team side of arbitration and working out all of these little tiny figures and figuring out what players are worth based on how much production they've had. I'm sure working with lawyers, working with agents and working with teams like that is that's a lot. That's a lot of experience to have at that young of age. And then right after that, he was hired in 2011 by Cleveland to be in tandem with uh, Derek Falvey, the director of baseball operations. Falvey, if you guys don't know right now, he is the president of baseball operations for the Twins. And at the time, they split those guys. Cleveland split their uh, responsibilities up into two two sections. Falvey was dealing a lot with transactions, hands-on stuff, while Stearns was working in the background, specifically data analysis, contracts, and just broader strategy for the organization. And ironically, he was hired in 2011 by Cleveland. It was the same year, but a little bit after they drafted Francisco Lindor in the first <laughs> round, which I thought was honestly kind of a funny That's cool. coincidence. Their paths might have like crossed briefly when Lindor was coming up through the minor leagues. And then after that, just one year in Cleveland, he was picked out by Jeffrey Lunau, who now is a bit of a, a disgraced major league figure, but at the time <laughs> was the architect of the Houston Astros. And Cern basically became his right-hand man in, in Houston. He was the assistant GM. Most organizations in baseball, even still, have a couple assistant general managers, anywhere from two to four. And the Mets, Mets have had that too for the last few years. It was just Stearns in Houston. It was him and well, Lunau. That was it. That was one-to-one. -one. And he had a great quote right before Stearns was hired by the Brewers that said, there's several people in our organization that have GM potential. Dave is one of them, which yeah. for a guy like Jeff Luna was really like cut to the chase, really just on the on the money. Like that's that's probably the highest compliment you could ever give somebody. Like I yeah, think he's I mean, one of them. And at the time, 2015, if I'm doing the, my math correctly here, he would have been 30 years old and the yes. Astros GM's like, yeah, this guy's going to be a GM. Like you, sh you should have him as your GM as a 30 year old, which is, I mean, at the time that was probably even a little bit more rare than it is now. Definitely. And even right after that, that was when the Brewers hired him to be their general manager. And I think he was, I don't think he was the youngest general manager hire ever because I think Theo was hired a little younger and John Daniels, you remember, yes. Brooklyn kid from the Rangers hired the 28 years old. And, but Stearns was in that like pantheon of these really, really young, like kind of superstar ascending GMs. And he just, from the time he sat down in Milwaukee, like he built a winner and something that has sustained like through then, like the Brewers had, some periods of success, I would say, like late 90s, early 2000s, they didn't really have an identity. They could never really build that consistently just without having that much money. But once Stearns got there, they had one more losing year in 2016, a year in which he went over a lot, a lot of turnover. He turned over most of the roster. He kept his coach that he inherited, manager Craig Council, but then he, he got rid of five of the other seven coaches in the Major League staff besides their hitting coach and the third base coach. They had they won 73, about 73, low 70s games 2016. And then every single year, besides the pandemic year, they were a winning, a winning team under Stearns. Yeah, and I think I, they made a run to the – they lost to the Dodgers, I think, right, in the NLCS, NLCS. in 2019, 2018? No, that was either 17 or 16, one of those oh, two. Oh, 17, uh, it was 18, it was 18. 18, okay, that makes sense because I was doing watch parties on YouTube for, like, all these games. And I remember, like, staying up super, super late watching those Dodgers-Brewers games. But they were awesome. They were such Great. good games. And, like – I think the thing that at least I appreciate the most about what David Stearns was able to accomplish, like that we knew of in Milwaukee, right? Because all these other teams, like we kind of know now that he was a part of them, but it wasn't necessarily like the thing that was like the calling card. Me and you, we're, we're pretty big fans of like what the Brewers have been able to do the last few years. A team that doesn't get to spend as much money as a team like the New York Mets, a team that develops the absolute heck out of pitching. I mean, they, they pulled Abner Uribe out of nowhere, just out of thin air, and he's one of the best relievers in baseball already in like 25 innings this year. But just being able to build sustainable winners with a very, very tight budget, super tight budget in a small market. I mean, like they're an hour away from Chicago. They get completely – most people in Milwaukee are Cubs fans for the most part, it seems like, because when they Cubs play games there, it's like a home game for them. And being able to still have that success, be one of the better teams, obviously the National League Central – not the toughest division by any means, but just being able to still be there and make some runs, 
super impressive, super. Yeah, those Brewers teams, I think, were known mostly for their professional development, acquiring veterans and helping them become better, and also <laughs> just, yeah, winning a lot on the margins, having amazing defense. Their record in one-run games and games side by less than three runs, fewer than three runs, was phenomenal under Stearns. Has a lot to do with defense, a lot to do with bullpens, which, as we talked about, bullpens were great. Even just this year, you talked about your eBay. But Joel Piamps, too. Same yeah. thing. That was amazing. A couple of years ago, Jay Cousins came out of nowhere. He I mean, flipped. you want to talk about a big one here. How about Christian Yelich became one of the best players in go. baseball yeah. as soon as he came to the Brewers? And that was the thing in 2018. That's what kind of drove that team. That was finally the superstar that tied together a very good roster that for a few years was knocking on the door. And also that year, a couple of things that happened. They got, again, a combined 67 home runs out of Jesus Aguilar and Travis Shaw. Yeah. Two guys who were kind of just retread journeyman. I think this was the first time. No, Aguilar was came back and this was the second team after he uh, he kind of resurfaced in the league. Check Aguilar was with, wow, he was with Cleveland in yeah. 2014 through 16. Then he went to Milwaukee. So yeah, this yeah. was his second team at that time. But that that's just kind of what these teams were known for. That was also the Eric, the Eric Thames year. Remember that one where he yeah. just hit oh, like 20 yeah. home runs in April, May out of nowhere. And then the season ended, but it was like, it was, it was a pretty good time there. I also thought it was funny that when he was hired to, to the Brewers general manager, their star player was Ryan Braun, who was a year older than Stearns at the time of hiring. <laughs> no which I, thought, yeah, I thought that was pretty funny, but that was kind of the mainstay of those Brewers teams where it's like, we're never going to be able to outspend you, but we're really going to be able to outwork you and find these little advantages. And again, something that was always, always, always done there was defense. It was so much defense. And maybe I wanted to ask Stearns this in the press conference today. I guess I wasn't big J enough. I didn't get to get a question off. We're not but, there yet. No, not there. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a growing J. I'm a medium J. I mean, yeah. really, in real life, I'm technically a small J, but that's yeah, kind of yeah, just sure. a, yeah. that's, 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 that's a handy result. No, you can't do anything about that. But I kind of wanted to ask him about that because those teams were characterized in a way that I think that they had to be because – when you don't have as much money as people you're playing against, I think the scene in Moneyball does this so well, as well as anything in pop culture. Like you can't, all right, you lost Giambi. How are you going to fix Giambi? You don't, you're not going to fix Giambi. You just got to get the on-base percentage and the home runs back. Like maybe just, I don't know if that was more philosophical or if that was just, this is our way to win. Like we're going to be on the edges. We're going to play good defense. We're going to figure out these bullpen arms rather than like, we're going to build a team like a juggernaut. You know what I mean? And that's something yeah. that I think kind of been, has been embodied a little bit by Andrew Friedman with, Dodgers where it's like when he was the architect of the Rays like it was a lot of pitching it was a lot of turnover but now he's with the Dodgers he's like oh yeah Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts are two of the best players in baseball like I want them yeah and I, I think like for those of you at home listening to us right now or wherever you are like you hear us talking about like the way that he was able to win in Milwaukee like you said the fringe the edges defense I don't think he's going to come here and build the team like the like the Brewers where it's like we're not going to spend a lot of money and we, we're just going to get these cheap guys and hope that they work out well like you said with Andrew Freeman I'm glad you brought that up He's a guy who came from the Rays, had an influx of money. He's like, oh, so I can have the best players in baseball, and I can still have my fun and pick off the guys on the fringes that everybody else misses. And then all of a sudden you're like, this team is incredible. Like, why is everybody on this team good? And it's because you have the core, and the Mets for sure have a core of players that is really, really is easy to build around. Is that is that fair to say? I mean, so strong up the middle. That's like the one – you look at all the really good teams, strong up the middle. Definitely. And I think that – um. That was a question that was happening a lot at the press conference today. Like, they were like, oh, so you had the Brewers, you had this great pitching, this great bullpen. Like, what are you going to do that there? And he was like, guys, like, this is a whole different organization. Like, yeah. I, there's, a, there's a lot of people that really work here. They're going to continue to work here. Like, I have to talk to them. I have to figure out where our strengths are, our weaknesses are. Like, I have to get under the hood now, figure that out. Like, it's not going to be one to one. Like, he really kept hammering his home. And I like that he kept hammering his home, where it's yeah. like, it's not just like, this is a like quote from me. He's like, there's no secret sauce, there's no magic formula, and there's no guarantees. Like, I'm going to do everything I'm in my power to build a winning team, but it's probably not, even if it works, it's probably not going to look like it did there. And again, just as an example of this, like we talked about this good 2018 Brewers uh, team. And then we talked about these Stern teams kind of being led by pitchers, like strong rotation. This can one's you, not. I can you it. name the pitchers from this team? Are you on the page or are you going to guess? I, yeah, I was on the page because I was going to bring it up of just like, yeah. again, like around the edges. And like you mentioned, like the, the pro player development. John, who's not here with us, obviously, but he he texts us about Julius Chassin having a 3-5 ERA this year. Julius Chassin, our favorite fake player, Chase Anderson, Junior Guerra, Brent Suter, who is now like a, a left-handed specialist for the Rockies, Wade Miley, Freddie Peralta. Those were the guys who got the majority of the starts on that team that year. And Zach none Davies. Of which, yeah, and Zach Davies. None of which you would say, like, that guy's a stud. But then, like, you had Brandon Woodruff, who was coming out of the pen. You had Corbin Burns, who was coming out of the pen. And then all of a sudden, now, pro player development, they're two of the best pitchers in baseball. Mm -hmm. And even Peralta, Peralta that year was the one who people were like, oh, we're going to have to put him back in the pen because he can't get through these games. But besides Freddie Peralta, we just named six starting pitchers who 
probably didn't throw a single pitch over 93 miles an hour for a full <laughs> season. And they were a game away from the World Series and had that series in their grasp against the Dodgers. I'm yep. sure that I'm sure something probably stuck with Stearns as well. But it's just like that is where that is where he's been so successful in the past. You talk, think about where he came from in his background that we just went over with you guys. Like he spent years in Major League's labor department. He is like an expert on how that works from the inside. Like, think about that for a second. How his contracts work, how arbitration works, how you negotiate. Like, that he is so within all of the background stuff that I feel like has been a bit lost in the last few years of this organization. Like, he is just an operations king. Like, that's yeah. the president of baseball operations. Like, that title can't get lost either. This is the first time the Mets have ever had somebody with that title. The president of baseball operations. Yep. Baseball operations are all the roster moves, all the little tiny things, options, IL. Like this is there's so much minutia that goes into this and he is the perfect guy for it. Yeah. And I mean, like, I think the Mets got a really good rep the last few off seasons with their spending, right? Everyone's like, you want to get paid. The Mets, the Mets are a good place to do that. Like they're going to go out and spend money. They're going to go and get the best players. They're trying to put a winning team on the field at all times. Stuff that you heard. I know not part of the team anymore, but Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, a bunch of the free agents that we've brought in talk about where they're like, it's really encouraging to be playing for a team. That's like, we're going to spend money. We're going to try and win at any cost possible. And now to bring in a guy like David Stearns, another person who's so well-respected in baseball, like you said, it just continues to even make the Mets a more enticing look for players or for like, how would you not want to be a part of this? How would you seriously not want to? You're in New York. Granted, some people don't like New York, but that's on you. You're, you're dumb. New York's the best place in the world. <laughs> New York, great team, great field, great owner, an awesome smart front office. Like what, what is, what would keep you out of here? And the best fan base in sports. Don't forget that Stearns actually had very Good podcast also, too. Yeah, great, and, and also a great official podcast. Like probably one of the best that exists. But there were just so many things that he said today too, where it was like you could feel the pride that he wasn't met. Like I yeah. never, I never thought I'd be like. First of all, I never thought I'd be sitting at the, the press conference of anyone hired <laughs> by the Mets to be the president, the GM, any of this stuff. The players last year, whatever. But just like hearing him gush about the Mets and be like, "This is it." Like, this is what I want. And then also hear him talk about the resources. I got a great quote here I wrote down. Having resources is definitely an advantage. I'm excited we have the resources we do. That's a good quote. Yep, <laughs> I like that a lot. That's really cool. He's like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Like, I just spent no money. Now I can spend a bunch of it. But, I mean, it's all going to be within reason. Like, it's not probably going to look like it did the last few years where it's just like, let's yeah. get it together. And Steve said that, too. He's like, now I have someone new here to collaborate with. I have someone new to talk about this value with. I have someone to talk about the contracts with who I'm giving – autonomy to like and we saw that again this was the first thing brought up in the press conference we didn't really get to talk about that with you guys yesterday because for the first time ever we record the podcast early and then buck show walter announces that he will not be back with the team next year but like that was that's autonomy like this was buck was someone that steve cohen handpicked to come in here and manage this team and then if it wasn't in the cards it wasn't in the cards and that was dave that was it like that's how it began like david stearns now will get to pick a manager for the first time in his career because he also inherited the craig council and council was in milwaukee the whole time with him yeah, and that was something he talked about a lot, too, in the press conference, is that they are not specifically looking for anything as a manager. They're going to look at first-time guys. They're going to look at guys with experience. They're going to look at young managers, old managers, guys who have played baseball, guys who didn't play at the professional level. Like He's like, we're casting a very, very wide net of what the possibilities of managers can be. Got, got a lot of time before the next season. Interview guys. Be very thorough. And I think that's something that you're going to get with Davis Sears. It seems like there is there's a process, something that we've talked about so, so much in the past. We're like, oh, kill for a process. And it seems like he's going to bring in a process that's not only been successful, but will continue to be successful. And it, it starts with the manager, which I feel like was probably the hot topic as well during this press conference, too. Yeah, a lot of people were asking it. A couple a couple questions. I think Joel Sherman asked one. I think Bruce Beck might have asked it, too. Two legends the of the legend? game. Legend? Bruce Beck's a legend. Bruce Beck is a New York City legend. He got, he's got that great journalist chin. He's got great journalist hair. He's like, great. Bruce great journalist name bruce beck like yeah, oh that's strong. like that's like a journalist a fake name in a book you're writing about a journalist like if like a fantasy novel well it's like it's i don't know it's like almost i know it's not like superman batman name but like it's kind of like the all like bruce the beck. yeah bruce yeah. beck like, be like if that guy was a vigilante at night too and no, fought like, crime i'd believe it like he's a sports journalist in a comic strip bruce beck yeah <laughs> like that's it but stearns again had a great quote about the manager what he's looking for in this he really really summed it up so well and summed up about how like the manager role is in modern baseball. He just said like, there's so much like on a manager, like in modern baseball. And it's not exactly the same way that we perceive them through baseball history, where it's kind of like they're the ambassador of the organization, but there's just like, you have to be in between so many different departments, so many different things. And this, again, this quote stuck with me. I view the managerial position as one of true partnership with the front office. We're, I want them to be working closely with the baseball ops groups to manage people and facilitate culture and to grow with the team and stay here for a long time. Period. That's cool. <laughs> 
I was just like, yeah. I, every, everything he was saying, I was just like, yeah, yeah, more, more, more. Keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. You, I didn't want it to end. You guys don't understand how hyped James is for this. Like, <laughs> so let's, peel, let's peel back the curtain a little bit here so you guys can get insight. So yesterday when this was like all happening or whatever and the, the press conferences was announced and everything, James was like asking everybody, like, how can I come? Can I come? Can I go? He's looking at me. He's like, you're not going to go. I'm like, dude, I got like a big, I got a big week ahead of me. Like, this is like one of my like few days where like I could like just sit at home, kind of plan, get ready for this next week. You're like, I can't believe you're not coming. Like, this is the most excited I've ever been to go to a press conference ever. I'm like, more than like when we Verlander, Senga, Scherzer, like, and you're like, yeah, I've never been more excited for anything. And to be fair, it fits you perfectly. Like, <laughs> I mean, you guys have heard some of the episodes that we've done, the amount of research that goes into just possible candidates for jobs that have been open in the past. And nothing James loves more than a, a little poli sci major who found his way into baseball. <laughs> literally this is my favorite thing on earth and just like talking to him i talked to will salmon a little bit because will used to be the beat writer for the brewers oh, for the yes. athletic before the mets and i was like you know is he like is he good to talk to you guys and he was like he is great like he he talks to us and like and just like listening to david cern's talk i was like this guy's freaking cool like he's smart like he's exciting i was like god he's a new yorker like new everything yorker. Goes, it's all it all goes so well together like even I took the seven train, local seven train, two ways today. I hour almost a full hour commute each direction. I was there for forty five minutes. Like, think about that for a second. I almost finished my book. Like, it was great. Yeah, I mean, it's it's exciting times. Like, there's just a lot of really really good things happening. And going back to what you were saying about the manager thing, like you said, like it's a collaborative effort, being very very involved. All things are super important. And again. You look at all the successful teams in baseball, maybe outside of the Astros, maybe outside of the Astros yeah. with Dusty Baker, but he's That's there for vibes. He's vibes. Yeah. That's it. And that was some of the things that Stearns talked about, facilitating culture and managing people. Like that's a yeah. huge part of being the modern baseball manager. And like maybe some of what's happened in baseball the last few years, like some of the game flow has been taken out of the manager's hands. And whether you think that is for better or for worse, it's just a simple reality of how many of these organizations are run now. And like, it's like, it just seems like he wants someone who's basically going to be a partner. Like he, and also yeah. he said, find the right person to grow with your organization and be here for a long time. Yeah. So like, I, I'm sure this, this hire might skew younger. I, it could skew someone who's a first time manager. I know a lot of people get scared of that. Sometimes we've had some PTSD in the past, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. A lot of great council was a first time manager when he was hired by the Brewers. Kevin Cash was a first time manager and he was hired by the Rays. Those I think two Dave been, Roberts was a first time manager. Yeah. As well. These guys, these guys have been stalwarts over the last few years. I, I'm going like to give, give John's Marlins a little credit here too. Skip Schumacher. First time awesome. manager awesome. looks like a really good manager. Yeah. Like, uh, the thing that we've joked about is we're like, we want Mets fans to be a little upset, a little mad with whoever the manager is. Cause like it, it does the, the notoriety, the publicity, like, okay, there's a, there's some guys out there that I'm sure that have like a, a track record or a resume that is very successful. And I wouldn't be opposed to bringing in maybe a successful manager like that. But like I want, I want, I want championships. I want winners. I want someone who's going to come in here and wants to win, wants to be a part of winning culture, been a part of winning culture, even experienced what it's like to win. And it's just like, if, if, if it's a first-time guy, I promise you I will not be mad. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about who the possible candidates could be whenever the, the rumors and everything start breaking like later on in the year. But it's just like getting the right guy in is super important, and it's, it's nice to see that he placed, I don't want to say emphasis, but the way that he described what he was looking for is a very refreshing take. Refreshing and incredibly modern. Like that yeah. is what that is what like the well-run organizations like to feel. And – I think emphasis is a good word because this is an important decision. Someone's going to like be interacting with the players on this team every single day. And the team has aspirations to uh, compete because that's another thing that David Stearns mentioned directly that he wasn't going to mortgage the future. He, he was very specific about that. It was going to be a delicate balance, but he said that this team, the idea concept, the idea is that they're going to be ready to go. 2024 yeah. is going to be a year where the Mets will compete. And that's something that, has been talked about a lot because of the Max Scherzer quote from around the trade deadline and just the way other some uh, media outlets have handled it the last few months. But he was very contrite. There's going to be a team that we expect to compete. He says probably, again, I want to find the exact word because he used, I have it somewhere as a quote in here. But, he, okay, here this. The goal is compete right now and do it in a way where it won't detract from our competitiveness in future years. Yep. And that, great. So that means I want to win now and then I want to win later. And another part about that winning now and winning later is he said, very, very simply, he expects Pete Alonso to be the first baseman of the team in 2024. Yes. That's what he said. That's direct quote. There's no, we're not reading into anything here. There's no inside information. There's no insight. That's what David Stern said publicly to the media a few to hours. the media. To Everyone media heard and, it. The media and me a few hours ago. That's yeah. It. I mean, I, I'd love Pete to still be here. He's the man. I love Pete. I mean, for, yeah. 46 home runs and what people are calling like Pete's worst year. 
since he's been in the majors. This is his worst year. He had 46 home runs, drove in what, like 120? Yeah, he's, he's he, he struck out too much. Oh, don't care. Don't care that he hit 220. Not important. 46 homers, 120 RBIs. One of the best first basemen in the game. I don't even think he struck out that much. I'm going to guess final season strikeout total right here. Also, if you go on Baseball Savant right now, it still has the Mets-Marlins game from last week in the top of the ninth. <laughs> Ooh, wait, you want to hear something funny? I'm just like going through the playoff teams because that's kind of where my head's been a little bit, and we'll talk more about it later. Baltimore, Brandon Hyde, uh, first-time manager? Yeah. Kevin Cash, Tampa Bay Rays, first-time manager? Yep. Blue Jays, who's their guy? John Schneider, right, I think? Yeah. First-time yeah. manager? Yeah. Minnesota Twins, Rocco Baldelli? Yeah. First time manager. All right, Dusty's not. Bruce Bochy's no. not. AL no. West, they're they're different. They're different. But <laughs> they got some young GMs in there. They got some young smart guys running that organization. Atlanta Braves, Brian Snicker. He was a first, first time, time manager, manager. technically. <laughs> technically he was. Phillies, Rob Thompson. First time manager. <laughs> first time manager. <laughs> Marlins. Team. Skip Schumacher. First, first time, time manager. manager. Milwaukee. First time manager. Dodgers, I don't know about Tori Lovello. Honestly, I don't know about him. I'm gonna no I'm gonna check this one. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he snuck in somewhere, like as a as an interim one day. Let's see. I'm gonna click his oh, that's that's not the manager page. Come on. We're botching this good podcasting. But yeah, keep looking up your stuff. No, uh, he was a he was first time manager, Tori Lovello. So that's so the whole postseason field, only two prior managers, and they one of them is a multiple time World Series champion, and one just got his first. Yes. Uh yeah. success. They've so this is actually kind of funny. Over. They're all first-time managers and two other guys who've been in baseball for upwards of 40 years. Yeah, but you know what they've done? They've won. Won. They've won. So yeah. that's a little. That's why you can do that when you're a little bit older. But, like, oh, it's just I, I love it. I'm excited. I'm super excited about David Stearns. I, I'm feeling a little bit like you were yesterday because now that I've, I've seen him talk, I've heard him say the words, and I'm like, ha-ha. <laughs> We got him. Let's go. We've wanted him forever. <laughs> Dude, there was such a buzz in that room, too. Like, you could feel like something important was going on. Like, Tacoma and Gelbs were wearing suits. Whoa. Like, yeah. Heyman was over there. Like, he was being funny, having questions. There was a nice spread, you know, out, like, you know, just in the media stuff. And it's just like, lots of camera people, lots of flashing lights. Like, it was, it was a buzz. Like, you could really feel like the energy in that room. Like, this is why I was so excited yesterday, where I was just like, this is happening. Like, this is someone who. Like for years, I've been like that. He is the guy. He is the yeah. perfect one. Like he is the one. Like listening to him talk about growing up a Mets fan is like what? When we first started the podcast, I think we talked about guys that we wanted yeah. to come in, and I think David <laughs> Stearns was. I like think we first. were like, David Stearns is the guy we want. We need him here. We want him here. He's a Mets guy. He's got to be here. And now that he's come and he's here and he's a part of the organization, he ru he's running the whole show. I mean, feels pretty good. Feels pretty good. Shout out to Mets stuff in twenty twenty one. Yeah, legend, legendary times. But so some other notes about things Stern, David said. Stern, what is David Stearns? I don't know what to call him. David Stearns? David Stearns. David Stearns. And David Stearns yeah. and uh, Mr. Steve President. Cohen said, yeah, Mr. Mr. President of Baseball Ops. Po yeah. Pobo. The Pobo. Pobo. Yeah. Pobo. P-O-B-O. But um, something that Steve said, he did a lot of due diligence on him, of course. And he said that the biggest thing that stuck out was that everyone who worked under him had incredible things to say. That he was just a wonderful boss, very collaborative, very open-minded. That's huge to me. Because this is going to be a big team of people. And something else that came up a lot is that there are people here from lots of different regimes. People who yes. have been here for a long time. People who have not been here for a long time. People who were hired by very different people who are either here or not anymore. And Stearns had a very good answer when asked that. He said that, I don't think, his exact quote, I, don't, I think that's a feature and not a bug. Because when you have people coming from all those different walks of life, you just have different voices in the room. And it seems like he is very collaborative and very, very open-minded. And yeah. he said that... Um, where is it? Where's the quote? He wants to build groups of really talented people at all levels of the organization who are energized to come to work every day and genuinely love working with each other. And I'm sure many of those people are already here. I'll tell you, he's got two of them right here. I, really any, anything they need. <laughs> anything they need besides the podcast. I mean, just, ha just happy to be podcasting. You got anything else for us? Let us know. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm energized and I'm motivated. I'm all both of those things. I'm really that right now. He also, this was, this one killed me as we started with. First of all, he gave Steve and Alex a lot of thanks. Talked about how great the process has been getting to know them and working with them so far. Excited to keep doing that. Talked about the impact the Mets have in the local community, which I think is really cool and really That's true. Cool. I don't think that there are many teams in baseball who are in as urban of an area as city field and have like as much of that like their local flavor here like you could just feel queens every time you go to the ballpark and that's very apparent thing but he said this one killed me this one might kill you too okay it's really cool that now my kids grow up to, can grow up to be mets fans oh that's awesome i love <laughs> so that good. How good yes. is that? that's amazing that's so right. relatable <laughs> oh my god it's amazing and um Steve said there wasn't really a serious conversation with anybody else because once negotiations began, it seemed like they were both on the same page. He said they both said they've been really happy to get to know each other. 
They were like a little, they were joking. They were a little smiling with each other a little bit. I called them dynamic duo on that stuff, Twitter. Um, it's just, they say, he said he expects to be here for a long time. Stern said he expects to be here for a long time. Like, I, I mean, I don't know. We're Mets fans. I sound like famous last words, but for some, for some reason, it's just something in my soul, in my chest right now, in my plums. Like, something feels different. It just does. Well, I'll tell you this. I mean, yesterday was a weird day. Yesterday, end of the season, bad season. I think we can say that. But today, sun, sun was out. Beautiful, mm-hmm. 75 degrees. Got a new mm-hmm. president of baseball operations. There's as weird as 2023 has been. Now it's on to 2024. It's on to bigger and better things. Future is the focus. And I'm super excited to see what the Mets' future looks like with David Stearns at the helm calling the shots. Here's another great quote he said. He said, I'm a fan. I've been a fan just like you guys. I know how much this team means to the fans and the community. I've also ridden the roller coaster of disappointment and hope. Literally, we talked about that when we were talking to Felix and Izzy for the yeah. uh, London series stuff that's going to be coming out in a little bit. That's one of the, they're like, explain being a Mets fan. I'm like, it's a roller coaster, man. Like, it's the, high, the highs are so high and the lows are about as low as you could possibly get. But when it hits, oh my God, it's incredible. Dude, another one that proved how much of a Mets fan David Stearns is. And I tweeted this one. He shouted out Eddie Coleman in his oh. press conference. Eddie Coleman's a legend, a legend of local radio. He said, I grew up listening to Gary Cohen, Bob Murphy, and Eddie Coleman. I was like, damn right you have. I <laughs> love Eddie Coleman. I love Eddie Coleman. I was, I, Eddie Coleman almost starstruck me the first time I saw him like back in like the press room. I think, yeah. Like, I was just like, oh my God, is that Coleman? You're like, what? <laughs> You're like, what do you mean? But it's just, he's, he's like, he's so real. He, said he doesn't take the opportunity lightly. He shouted out Omar for hiring way back when. He said, wow. told him a lot about. Like a lot of things he's taken with him his whole career. He just said like working for so many different people and organizations. Like he thought that was such a benefit to what he's able, it's like how he's been able to learn and grow as an executive. Like there was so much good stuff. Like, and he also said like he was so excited by this. I think Tacoma was like, when did this start to feel real? He was like, not till it was official. He's like, it's not official. It's not real. Like, <laughs> that's, I tried. that's a Met fan at heart right, right? there. <laughs> yeah, I'm not ahead of myself here. And he was like, I had to stay balanced because this was just like, this was so important to me that like, and he said, didn't take the opportunity lightly. Just like, just like one of us, you know, New York guys, yeah. graduated from college, likes baseball and the Mets, just like us. Definitely not a difference in anything else. No, for sure. Yeah, I feel like that may be his brain power and his, uh, his mastery of like things like Python, R, and Excel. Like that's probably sure. some big ones. Yeah, sure. the, the data systems that are going to be applied now, which I'm very excited about. Probably knows his way around a computer real well. Oh, he, he could probably do things with a keyboard that would make our head spin. They, have you seen? Have you ever seen the like Excel speed runs on like TikTok or Instagram? No, but our old roommate Alex, I've seen him do it. The, but it's cra- like this is a thing. There's competitive Excel where that's, people. That's it's deep. like do this as fast as possible. I've watched it. I that's was like, problem. I don't. I don't even understand what's going on here. I'm like, there's buttons that do this. I, I'm locking it. I mean, let's get ahead of ourselves here. But yeah, we're just excited. We're happy. I didn't expect on October second to be excited about the the Met season being over. But a lot of good things have happened. I'm giddy. It was amazing. I just, I can't believe he was just talking like that. Like every single word that was just like, I trust you. 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 <laughs> we were talking about in the office after I went up to hang out with John for a little bit. I was talking to Jenna, Brian, and it was just like, he, like every, everything he said, I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep talking. Like he just he felt so smart. Felt so like comfortable and normal. Like everything just felt good. He also talked about like having a good relationship with Billy already. He said yes. like, he said, yeah, we're, we've been competitors. <laughs> he said, I respect him a lot of what he's done in the game, which is pretty cool, honestly. He and Zausmer are sitting in the front, and uh, there's just there's definitely a lot of work to be done. He didn't take that lightly, and there's definitely no secret sauce. It's not going to look like the Brewers, but he's he seems very motivated and very ready to get back to work. And also just kind of also took a year, not off, because he was still in an advisory role with the Brewers, but definitely stepped back. He said he talked about reflecting over the last year, spending more time with his family, like understanding where he wanted to go next in his life and his baseball journey, and just – he seems very grounded. He seems very, very, very excited and very ready and very yeah, capable. I mean, shout out Billy. Also put them put him in a pretty good spot right now. Like there's a great core. There's a great farm system. One of the budding farm systems right now in Major League Baseball. It's a good spot to come into. And Billy definitely helped with that this year. Getting rid of Verlander, Scherzer, getting rid of guys and bringing in these young young talent. Got got a great prospect from the Marlins for David Robertson. He's a free agent at the end of the year. The guy might not even be in Miami anymore. We might not have been in New York. Like put him in a very good spot to now build this team to become hopefully a championship competitor, win some championships here. There's so many, so many great things that are happening. Like, and also like they did talk a little bit about the buck situation too. And how, like how it was just felt a little weird, like the timing of it all, you know, yeah. especially for the podcasters. I'm sure that Steve is very, uh, you know, yeah, very apologetic yeah. To, the, to the team's official podcast. But the fact that um, he just said it was literally a tight window. Like we knew we had to do this today because they didn't want to go up against the playoffs starting on Tuesday. And so it was like, it just had to happen. Like it just said, it was unfortunate the way it went down. 
Stern said there was no ill will. They talked this morning yeah. just about, like he said, the team is in a much better place for Buck having been here. And I agree with him. Yeah, no, I mean, Buck brought a lot of great things to the table, had a great season in 2022. There's no doubt about it. It's great with the media, great with the fans. I mean, Francisco Lindor loves him. Like, he was very, you saw the players. The players were getting emotional yesterday, like, for his yeah. last game. That big hug Whatever, with him and Lindor, I was like, yeah. Yeah, like, whatever you your personal opinion is on Buck, how he, his job was, whatever, I think you can definitely tell that he made an impact on the players, on the team, on the culture moving forward, and, you know, wish the best for Buck and, he said he's not done yet. He, if he's ready to keep managing, so maybe we'll go up against him soon one day. Yeah, no, just so many things. So many things are happening. So many things have happened. Like it's just, it, I just, I can't even understand how different this feels. Like I don't know. Like he's talking about the Mets and he's like the pride. I'm just like, yes. Shout out it. to Ernie. Shout out to Ernie. Ernie, our friend. Yeah. A video of him denouncing being in a. He still likes the Mets. He can still root for them. He's still gonna get tickets. He's still gonna come and cheer. But he's like, I. He is a Marlins fan at heart, and that's huge for us. You guys know. Or he's been a little bit of the mush, a little bit of the jinx. We love you, Ernie. But you switch him back to the Marlins, huge stuff. Look at that. David Stearns, right in, like two days later. It's good yeah, stuff. that's it. And we're, just, we're all here. We got David Stearns said we got to create our own blueprint here, and that's what we're going to do. Yep, 100%. Now, just some other little housekeeping things, of course. The wild card series is about to start, and even though the Mets are not in, I think we're still just going to briefly talk about it a little bit. There's some really great matchups. I'm trying to currently figure out what games I'm going to go to, because I'm going to be flying out Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe even Thursday if there's game threes for some of them. But you're looking at the matchups right now of the Brewers going up against the Diamondbacks. you got the Phillies going up against the Marlins in the National League. And then the American League, you got the Rays versus the Rangers and the Twins versus the Blue Jays. I mean, we want, we want to do predictions. You want to start it off maybe with yours? Yeah, I'm not talk about too. We can just talk about the tenor of all these series as a whole because I think it's very funny to look at them. Um, all games will be starting. All series will be starting Tuesday, play Wednesday and Thursday if they need game three. And the cities that these are taking place in, Tampa Bay, Minnesota, Milwaukee, Philadelphia. You know, I mean, for, for content creator like you, like that's a real, you know, murderous row for, for content creation in terms of, you know, big, beautiful cities in America. But tickets for Tampa Bay, cheapest ticket to get in now is $26. Whoa. Minnesota, cheapest ticket to get into the Minnesota game Tuesday afternoon, $4. Book it. I'm in. Let's go to Minnesota. Milwaukee Brewers, cheapest ticket, $20. Philadelphia Phillies, 166 that one makes sense. Yes. But I think it's just, it's crazy to think about that. Like these are the markets that are in the playoffs right now. It's funny to see the reflection of these prices. We remember the Mets last year. That was a that was mayhem, those three Padres games. That yeah. was some of the most I've ever had a baseball game in my life, that game too. Game, game one and three was awesome. Qu- quite the opposite. Some of the least. Yeah, game one and three. Life, I'd, love to, I'd love to forget those. I, I have. They're out of my mind. But I do think that as the American League, especially, I think the series are a little bit less straightforward. Uh, maybe in a way, because I just think I think the marquee series is wild card rounds the Blue Jays and the Twins. I think those are two teams with good rosters with holes. It probably has the most star power of any of these series. I think weirdly mm. enough, you don't think? No, I think I think just simply the the Phillies having Bryce Harper is just that's that's the that's the biggest star in the entire wild card round. That's and they, they got the primetime game too, eight o'clock. I mean, that's sure. that but tells you everything you need to know. Yes, they're also playing against the Marlins, who who have the dearth of star power. But they're also they're also they can weirdly they can weirdly just win a series because they, I don't know, the Phillies the Phillies have weird the Phillies thing is weird to me right now because when you have such a magical run one year, it's so hard to just what huge news actually breaking news right now. Brandon Woodruff out for the wild card series, oh. right shoulder capsule injury. He's available for the postseason. His availability for the postseason up in the air at this point completely changes my, my prediction i think right now oh yeah that's her oh my God. He, he's been their best pitcher by far over the last couple months since he came back from injury that's huge tough, day for, tough day for the brewers tough day for the brewers real shame I would, I would hate to be a brewer but um i don't know if we want to just do general predictions like rays rangers i feel like the rangers have lost all their juju and the rays are so good at everything the rangers are not which is just basically bullpen and late kind of late game decision making i really just i think that the organization has gone through so much this year, and they've been so good at home, especially that they're. I I, I like them to move on, especially because it's Rangers core. Like Semi and Seager have been in playoff series, but none of these other guys have really done it. Montgomery has, but I don't think he's ever. You know, like is he like he's. I don't know. He's gonna be a game one star. Like I, I don't know. It's it's tough because like I especially I feel like in this wild card series, pitching is so so important. Like just even keeping the game close, as we saw last year, can completely change the entire outlook of this game. Like being able to keep that game close is important. And I think the Rays will be able to keep these games close. Like regardless, as soon as they get into trouble, who's next? They're gonna bring in the next guy. And I'm kind of with you. I I was feeling the Rangers. I mean, I I'm I'm definitely rooting for them to do well because I like a lot of the players on their team. Yeah, but, I, I'm most definitely rooting for the Rangers, for sure. Yeah, but 
I, I, I think that we both have a saying. You just don't, don't doubt the Rays. You can't <laughs> doubt the Rays. I might not pick them to go far, but I do think that they're going to win this series. Their bullpen is just incredible. And it's the Rays. They just got some weird magic. You just, I, it's going to be tough to beat them. But yeah, that's they, a good series. They, they, they certainly underwhelmed the last year in the series against the Guardians. They looked, they just couldn't score a run. And it's funny that yeah. this, in a roundabout way, the Rays having one of the best offensive stretches in Major League history to start a season. And then they now came up upon the end of the year and they're cl- back to being great bullpen and offense that kind of scuffles a little bit. But I think right now it's it kind of went under the radar because he didn't start the season, but Tyler glass now is might be the best pitcher pitching right now as okay. something I can say, if you look at the last like six months, like what he's been able to do and not six months, six weeks, like he's been completely untouchable. Last time I think one star that wants to say was against the Yankees or the Red Sox last week or the week before. It's just, he's, He's been unstoppable. The Rangers starting pitching depth is an issue. Their bullpen's a huge issue. They, they they blow saves left and right. We saw many of them over the like over the last couple yeah. of months. Jordan Montgomery's a great pitcher. He probably got them to the playoffs, but as a game one starter in Tampa Bay, that's a little worrisome. I don't know, Especially I think because I, they they platoon and they'll just fill that that lineup crushes lefties, I think, as well. Yeah, and they're, 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 that seems great. I, he's, I pray this right now. He's his man on fire. Yandy Diaz, highest batting average in the American League. Not a batting yeah. average podcast. Yeah, three thirty. It was shockingly high batting average. And then, oh, but I do. I keep coming back to this Twins Blue Jays series. I just think that's the most. It might not be the most star power. You probably are right just about having Bryce Harper. But that's the most fun series. I agree. I like that's the, Minnesota, especially four dollar tickets. I mean, that's when I've got circled. <laughs> Never been to the Great North, but Minnesota, like they are such a such a weird team because they have all the makings of a team that could like sneaky put together a run. Like they've got great starting pitching, great bullpen. And they've got home run power in that lineup. But what scares me always with the Twins is that something happens when they get to the postseason. I don't know if the lights are too bright or if they just are choke. Like, I don't know. I don't know if it's Rocco Baldelli. But they just, they don't ever seem to push through. Granted, they don't have to play the Yankees. Huge plus. They can't beat that team in the playoffs. They never will. The Blue Jays also kind of have a little bit of choke in them as well. Just kind of a little bit of like, when are you going to really push through and actually be good like you have all this talent when's it gonna happen that's what i was kind of getting at with this series why it's so fun this is like the unstoppable force me see movable object where it's like why who like who someone has to win this series like someone has yes. to and the blue jays are lined up really well right now having clinched the second last day of the year where kevin gaussman is ready for game one and then yeah. they kind of haven't decided yet because kikuchi pitched friday bassett pitched last thursday who is going to start that game two and it's probably gonna be one of them i think the blue jays are also behind gaussman it's kind of interesting they have they have one of the sturdiest rotations in baseball this year. I think they're the only team that have four pitchers pitch 150 uh, plus innings. Oh, I'm pretty okay. sure I saw that. But it's also the fact that, like, Kuchi, Gaussman, Ber- uh, Brios, all very good pitchers. But it's like, who, can one of those guys be a stopper behind Gaussman? Can someone else go out and win a game? Because, like, Twins, Pablo Lopez, fantastic. One of the most underrated Stug. pitchers in baseball. And Sonny Gray is also awesome. But again, yeah. like, that, the, like, while those two guys are both below Gaussman, I think those guys are both above Kuchi and Bassett as well and Brios. Yeah. So I think that is kind of the advantage there. Even though the Blue Jays have been a weird offensive team this year, the Twins have gotten hot and cold. We all know about Royce Lewis. That's a fun – that like that series to me just oozes the most fun. The, the Diamondbacks gave up so many resources over the weekend to reach the playoffs, and now they're going to have Brandon Fott pitching in Milwaukee against Corbin Burns, which that's great for Brandon Fott. He's had a great second half after an abysmal first half. He kind of made a little on-mound adjustment, and now the cut of his fastball kind of works off better to both righties and lefties. But no Woodruff helps them out a lot, and you can get Gallon against – I guess that'll be Freddie Peralta in game two. Still great, but still that's great. Yeah. yeah, that's all. These are, these are fun. These are fun. I'm re- I'm, oh, I can't wait for next week, too. So, wait, yes. so who are you going Twins Blue Jays then? Twins Blue Jays? I got something. Something my, some of my stones is telling me the Blue Jays. Wow. Okay. I'm going Twins. I'm going okay. Twins on this one. I, so you mentioned that stat about the four inning or four pitchers with 150 or more innings. Twins were unbelievably close, but because they sent Bailey Ober down to maybe limit his innings, it might have mm. seemed like a little bit. He got to 144. Otherwise, they ah. also would have had four. Nice. That's interesting. All right. So two teams and those two teams kind of feel like a little similar in a way too, where it's like they do. big, big power in the lineup. Lime kind of falls off. And then like bullpen, like the twin, the twins bullpen. I'm, I'm really excited good. to see what they, they're going to be able to do in the small sample size. Kind of put them on the map a little bit. Caleb deal bar. Griffin Jackson's ERA looks that looks not so good. Joan Duran's Joan been Durant. hit. Joan Duran's like he, he, people have never seen Joan Duran pitch. are going to see him pitch. But like, what is this? Like this guy, in yeah. <laughs> if people haven't seen the splinker and you see the splinker, you're going to be like, Oh, how'd that happen? <laughs> but that, that's how All it's right, going to so- be. So you've got the Rays and the Blue Jays moving on in the American League. I've got yeah. Rays and Twins. I like that. I like that we're not picking all the same teams. Moving yeah. on to the National League now. You talked about Brewers Diamondbacks a little bit. Who you got there? Give me the D-backs. Ooh, kind of I fun. was kind a little fun I, with with Woodruff getting hurt. Yeah, I, I I was kind of feeling the D-backs a little bit before. 
because I was like, they're fun. And sometimes like you need a little chaos. You need a little bit of chaos. Oh, do I want to take the Diamondbacks? I think I'm going to be rooting for the Diamondbacks. That's for sure. I just, Corbin Carroll is awesome. Christian Walker, South Carolina Gamecock. Can tell Marte, stud, so jacked. That guy's so strong. He's incredible. Just a good team. Good, fun team. Jordan Lawler, too, maybe get a little action in the postseason here. Yeah, I'm going to go Diamondbacks, too. I'm going to go Diamondbacks, too. That yeah. might be more of a I'm rooting for pick rather than what I truly believe. But if Woodruff was healthy, no no chance I think the Brewers would take this easy. I think so, too. The only thing that does scare me about the Diamondbacks is that they have had major ebbs and flows with their offense over the course of the season. And their last uh, five games played here, they lost four of them, four in a row to end the season, which is crazy. They still made the playoffs because they went a huge winning streak right before that where they just dismantled the Cubs over a two-week stretch. Scored one run, zero runs, one run, one run, three runs in their last oh, five regular season games. I'm going back, Brewers, then. Go back to the Brewers? All right. I'm back. Brewers. I'm, just, I'm I think I, I think there, I think there's something about a switch, uh, f- a switch flipping in the postseason a little bit, but I still I don't know losing like your superstar pitcher in postseason eve. It's probably a little Tough. gut punch, but then experience manager probably probably can get through if anyone can. But I like that, and then I just I think I think both of us probably think the Phillies are going to just handle the Marlins. Yeah, I mean, listen, I'm not going to count the Marlins out because they've no. definitely got some magic going on right now, and Jake Berger has been possibly the best pickup of the uh, trade <laughs> deadline as you've declared him. Yeah, but. It's it depends. Like what Jesus Lazardo do they get? Do they get the Jesus Lazardo we've seen this year? Because if so, he's gonna give that lineup fits. He's been disgusting. Is Sandy do we know if Sandy gonna pitch? No. It is not okay. expect to. Right now they're lined up for Lazardo and Braxton Garrett for games one and two against Wheeler and oh, the Oh, not Yuri Perez either. Interesting. I'm sure I just think because of Yuri's ending stuff that he is the first guy of the bullpen no matter what game it is. Okay. Especially because both of those uh pitchers are gonna be lefties and the Phillies are gonna build out a more righty heavy lineup. So I think then yeah. you can kind of bring Yuri in as a hammer. Even if it's just yeah. like even if Lazardo's pitching well, but he just has a high pitch count, a lot of base runners for four or five innings, just knock him, give give Yuri three, and then see if you can get to the bullpen. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go Phillies. Uh, this will also be super interesting because this will be the first time that this Marlins team will actually be playing in front of a, a, a crowd because obviously they don't put anybody in Lone Depot Park. Yeah. And I'll give I'll give Phillies fans this: they're gonna they're gonna fill out Citizens oh, Bank Park, they and they're pack, gonna be they loud. The bank. They're gonna be ra- they're gonna be raucous. They're gonna be loud. They uh they did sell out like quite a bit during their uh, little bit prime with you know, Howard and Rollins and all those guys. But yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say the Marlins have no chance. Cause that's, no. that's insane. It's baseball. Baseball is, this is why baseball is awesome. This is why you watch postseason baseball for the chaos. Jazz Chisholm could just take over the series. You don't know. This could be cool to see him on the national stage too. give him a little bit more shine. Cause he's a fun, awesome player, but yeah, I mean, Phillies are a dangerous team. We saw what they did last year. I'm picking them again. The Phillies are dangerous though, but behind one and two right now, it's a big question mark. Like just Chris Sanchez, who's been at who been probably the third best pitcher all year, possibly even their second best ahead of Aaron Nola. Does he get that third I'll, start? I don't know. I'll say this. If it goes to three games, Marlins are winning it. Okay. But I mean who's he who's the Marlins game three pitcher? Don't worry about it. Don't <laughs> right, worry about it. Can't can't worry about that. Worry worry about getting there. Who are you who are you rooting for here? In that series? Yeah. Phillies. Anyone any anyone alive who could beat the Braves? Yeah, I, that's I all that matters. That's yeah, that whoever matters. can beat the Braves, that's what we want to win. That's why I switched it back to the Brewers because I yeah. they can beat the Braves too if they if they get there. I think I think I, I think you're selling Diamondbacks a little short. I know that bullpen's probably not exactly you know like World Series caliber, but it scares me. That bullpen terrifies me. Yeah. Like just the fact that Miguel Castro could be coming out in like the eighth <laughs> inning is just like whew, I'm gonna need like to take like a antacid. <laughs> antacid to breathe against the Braves. All right. <laughs> I think I think we're good though here. We covered a lot here. This was a, a funny again, guys. Again, episodes back to back days, but a lot happened today in the Mets, and just lo- like talking ball. Yeah, like talking ball. Anything else that happens during the off season and stuff? Of course, we will be here for you guys. So make sure you're following us on everything social media at Mets Up YouTube channel. Go subscribe to the New York Mets, and if you're listening to us, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Odyssey, download the podcast, subscribe, give us a rating, give us a review. We'll start shouting you guys out again if you're dropping some reviews for us. We do appreciate that. Follow James on Twitter at. James underscore Shiano. And me, Giraffe Neck Mark with a C. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. Shout out David Stern. So hope you're listening and watching as well. That'd be cool. Probably not. But hey, we're big fans. Welcome to New York. Let's go Mets. Let's go Mets. See you guys next time.